I wanted to work with human movement, it incorporated math and science, force and torque, joint movements, the way that the knee moves just with kicking a soccer ball. I had no idea the exercise science facility was so big and so developed. I started learning about the research that had come out of this facility. They've done things with children, with diabetes, and I think that's what started gearing me more towards the research side. One of my professors had such a passion for it, and so I started talking to him and seeing if I could get something maybe in the research field. At the U.S. Army Research Institute, I worked with strictly soldiers, and I realized that they're just like athletes. They're fully conditioned, they're just as strong, and they work just as hard, sometimes even harder, because they're determined. I was working on a data set about two years into the making. I found that the data had been collected incorrectly. So then I got on board with a guy who had actually developed the software. I got all the data for him, the subject's weights, their heights, exactly what force had been used, the percentage of the force plates that were used. They told me that if I hadn't found it, they would have had to go back and redo that whole section of the study, which would have taken more years and more time and more money. The work I was doing was helping with injury prevention and low carriage and making sure these soldiers could go where they needed to go and be where they needed to be. My boss awarded me the commander's coin. I didn't know that all the stuff I'd learned in the classroom could be coming into effect so soon after I'd learned it, even before I graduated. <laughs>
back-to-back, -back, Sam Sia uh, from Columbia University, talking about this very high-tech and yet affordable um, uh, device that it, you know, could potentially save a lot of lives uh, in developing countries, um, specifically through HIV testing. And so that's just not possible to develop at the community level. The technology is just there, not there, but it's a very valuable thing. And uh, then you had Amy Smith following that and talking about um, very much a grassroots uh, way of developing technologies. And so it just is an amazing breadth of possibilities of how things work together, how people really com comes down to people working together, um, you know, the, the flow of money and resources, the flow of knowledge back and forth. Uh, I think that's been one real valuable lesson, too, that, that people in developing countries have so much to offer in terms of, of knowledge and other resources. The moment you enter and the moment you start talking about the program, everything is geared towards your success. The facilities are outstanding, the faculty is, is really top notch. Ball State University utilizes the, the current innovative technologies. So we're using these things on a day to day basis, but we're also utilizing analog tools as well, like trace paper, pen, paper, uh, these things that you could really capture ideas quickly. You get to design things that are innovative and creative, but yet you could see them being built. Right now, it's pretty much given that any project that we design, sustainability is going to be a factor. The projects that get constantly get you to think in different ways and to challenge yourself, and the professors will ask you questions to kind of explore your design. College of Architecture and Planning really you know, sends us out into the field, sends us to different cities, to different cultures. We're looking at the broader context, we're looking at the rest of the world, and we're really thinking globally and acting locally. It's a wonderful balance between the theory and the practice and being able to apply the research and the knowledge that's gained in the real world. The program is, is very rigorous, but at the same time, it brings a lot of satisfaction and you know, a good outcome. Project 18 is a partnership between Ball State University, Peyton Manning Children's Hospital at St. Vincent, and Marsh Supermarkets. The idea with the project was to fight childhood obesity in the state of Indiana through community outreach and a school program. The immersive learning team had people from the business college and the health sciences, nutrition, nursing. I was the only education major on the team, which was a little intimidating, but also really exciting at the same time. It was really great to have a faculty mentor on the team to guide us. She really stepped back and let us do the project on our own. And she just kind of stepped in when our real world knowledge wasn't quite filled in and she could help us to, to kind of bridge the gap. The night before wasn't terrible. We stayed up until about 2 in the morning. 
the night before that, we closed to the library at 3 and didn't leave till 3.30. <laughs> Presenting for professionals as a student is incredibly intimidating. <laughs> it's a little a little scary, but it's one of those things you learn to overcome that fear. There were professionals from St. Vincent, people from Marsh, teachers and professors at Ball State University. It was a very intense feeling. <laughs> I think I can communicate my ideas better and I'm much more confident in my ideas as well. At this point, we're at hundreds of schools across the entire state. The really great part about the immersive learning opportunity is that it's a real experience for real life partners. I think the immersive learning programs at Ball State are really unique. It's not what you expect initially when you go to college, like having an actual impact. Project one. We are a collective of designers, fabricators, students pursuing a common question. Our project is based on a shared love of making. We all have unique skills, but we also have common skills and goals within the realm of digital fabrication, making, and architectural design. Project one was based on an initial understanding of tools and their making capabilities. It has continually evolved throughout the year and become various things throughout the year. And at the final presentation, it has become a sort of a criticism as well as uh, an internal dialogue as to what we see in the world and how we see ourselves practicing. What we've noticed throughout our work and our research is that there are basically two sides to practice. There's a side in fabrication and then there's a side in design and there are a lot of emerging practices that are trying to combine those two, but they're still at a very small scale. So a lot of the research that we've done is trying to figure out how these can be combined into one critical practice and how these can offer basically better solutions for practice and better solutions for the products and the designs that we make. The practice that we are uh, attempting to Thank you.
Okay, all right. Um, good afternoon again. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge and thank some individuals uh, who have uh, been instrumental and essential in making this event possible. And uh, there is one individual who tirelessly, intelligently, and patiently uh, really walked this whole process through and uh, made this her mission. And I would like to, uh, and, and without her, really, I don't know how we could have done uh, even half a job that we have been able to do here. And uh, that individual deserves a very special thanks. And uh, Tammy, thank you so much. And she is very humble. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, support uh, provided by Gretchen, who has been behind the scenes, and yet she has been so effective and essential to make this happen. She came early here uh, to help us out in any way possible, and she has done a superb job. Gretchen Crutchfield, thank you so much. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the help provided by Patty Jo Snyder and Angeline Mendes from ASME who are not here but have uh, provided uh, help at various stages of this event. And I uh, would like to thank, and there is one person whom you have uh, seen a lot around here and if things have gone smoothly with our uh, audio visuals and technology and that uh, and to capture the spirit of this whole event and photograph it well. Uh, there is one individual who's always cheerful and always willing to help, and I really love to work with him uh, again and again, Chris Helms. Thank you. <laughs> And you have seen beautiful things. You have seen a lot of beautiful things and wonderful graphic work. Uh, and it takes a lot of work uh, to get all of these things uh, in time and uh, in, a, in a fantastic way. And two individuals have uh, really taken that up as a special project. Brandon Hooping Gardner and James DeChant. Let's give them a hand. And um, last but definitely not the least, you have seen these people being, becoming part of this, adapt to the situation, help us in many, many possible ways. And uh, these are the volunteers who um, are from the College of Architecture and Planning and also from the College of Business. Uh, and first, I would like to thank and acknowledge uh, Ashley Stoker, who is uh, an employee with our office, but she has jumped into it. Uh, with such enthusiasm that it was uh, just contagious and I thank her for you know uh, helping us by actually managing and coordinating uh, the volunteer activities so first thank you Ashley and I would like to uh, welcome you to talk about the volunteers and uh, mention them as well so applause please All the people in the red shirts, um, and even some people who aren't in red shirts, have been around to help you guys and take notes and to um, listen to you, and they've really gained a lot, I think. And some of them have been really 
excited to come, and a lot of them have been even more excited to hear you guys and meet you guys. So um, some of those people, uh, I'm going to say most of the names, are um, Farah, and she's gone, uh, Marley Braben, Matthew Fullenkamp, Sally, Salil Nair, Katie Popple, Resmi Satsin, I can't even, <laughs> sorry, um, Ann Schnitzenbaumer, and Madeline Toth, Katie Warner, and Ann Schneider. And if I miss anyone, the people you've seen in red shirts are your volunteers, and they were really excited to see you. So thank you for letting us be here. Great. So, um, and I'd like to conclude uh, uh, my acknowledgement of uh, uh, the contributions by thanking the catering staff who have provided uh, fantastic food and service uh, that uh, allowed us to survive and, <laughs> and uh, be well nourished through all this activity. So uh, thank, I'd like to thank them as well. Great. With that, we will get started with uh, the final report back session that we have uh, been awaiting these two days. And uh, to get us started, uh, maybe I think Shekhar is still putting up his sheets there. Uh, so why don't we uh, get started and uh, shall we go by group number? Okay. So group one. You know the group numbers? You are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, group two. And there is a microphone, and if you'd like uh, a handheld, we'll provide that. Okay, here we have group two is facilitated by Kevin Klinger, uh, consists of uh, Larry Barrow, Elizabeth uh, Liz Kissenweather, Karthi Gramani, and Lou Terman. All right, thank you. So we put this together as an initial kind of guiding flip chart. Um, what do we believe and are some of the key values we need to keep in mind for our clients? What are the problems we face? How do we proceed and what resources are needed? So these are really the major categories we're going to report out on. Um, sorry, Shaker, it's not going to be the formula you gave us. <laughs> um, so this was a, a mind map that was done early, and it turns out that we've referred back to it more than once uh, with extreme affordability in the, in the center, and a lot of the key concepts we saw across the two days, um, things related to, to transportation and how, in, how important that is, how different it can be, how values can drive decisions. Uh, came back to this, the fact that the world's driven by profit, but hopefully fair profit. Um, the genesis of ideas and opportunities and how extreme affordability and, ex and um, extreme affordability and technology fit into that. And then the question of doability. Is that a word? Doability? Um, and shelter because we have um, housing expertise in our team and all of the issues of housing, uh, especially urban housing. So this was our kind of our start point. And our first, our first topic, um, taking a look at values. And early on, we, I think our group agreed that uh, it has to be there, very, very there meaning our, our target customers' values, priorities, and needs. And if we don't start there, we're boxing ourselves into a corner. Um, there was some discussion on what if um, values and how the society doesn't necessarily run the way our society does, you know, how, uh, what kind of stand or no stand do we take on that? We discussed some of that. And asking questions related to values, needs, and the big goal is to make life less stressful and unlivable, right? That's our, our uh, overall, overall goal. So opportunities uh, that we see are actually problems for our clients. I think this got, there we go. 
Um, ooh, thank you. Um, so early, again, early on, we said we need to make sure we understand the problem. You know, we can arrive and perceive a problem, but it needs to come from the people we're working with and supporting. Uh, some discussions on this concept of payoff, our perceived payoff versus um, their needs and meeting their needs. Education came up a lot in our discussions. Uh, we think of reading and writing education, but there's uh, all kinds of education. If the clients you're working with are, can't, are, are literate, you can still do a lot of education in, in health and um, agriculture and everything else. So we need to reframe um, education sometimes. And I think in, in challenges, opportunities, and, and problems, I think, again, parts, parts of our team were much more uh, in the know on the transition from rural to urban and the migration that's happening and how that's uh, perhaps going to be driving where the real challenges are in the future in housing um, and all the things related to housing as far as water and electricity and, and energy. So the next uh, seg segment uh, was processes. And again, I tried, I'm going to try and condense these down a little bit. In the United States, we have this in intellectual property process that can hinder what we do at the university. We need to figure out how to get around that or work through it better. But more research is needed, obviously, in um, extreme affordability to drive the costs down for, for example, solar cell technology. It's happening, but that, that needs to keep happening. So a process, again, would be what are the needs we need to address, um, understanding those needs, and, and helping map those onto uh, research and how we can really participate with our, with our clients. And the restaurant activity, I think, turned out to be pretty, ex pretty interesting uh, for our group. We hadn't phrased it in that term, so we started out talking about the different, uh, looking at, at a restaurant scenario, just customer service, marketing, cooking, franchising, uh, profit sanitation, all the way down to waste stream. You know, how do you handle the, the food you use and the foods you don't use and the preparation waste from this holistic attitude and then started mapping it onto the customers are the, the people that are in the, the base of the pyramid. And I think it brought out some things, for instance, we haven't talked about skill building and training. We hadn't, that hadn't come on our radar screen before, so that was, that was helpful. Um, the franchising kind of drew this, the sharing knowledge and ensuring you're sharing knowledge in the, in the work that you're doing. And efficiency, you know, getting back to the model of, you know, there really shouldn't be any waste. If we're, if we're doing it right, they're not imitating the Western world or the developed world. Um, and we're following nature uh, better than the Western or the developed world is doing. Uh, this was a, so resources is the, is the last item, and then we'll get to a big, kind of a big bang, I hope. Um, so resources, again, on-site contacts, partners are key to doing this the right way. Um, we talked about the fact that we may not be doing a, a great job at publicity of uh, what we're doing in the mainstream. Engineering for Change is a great website, but I think if you talk to people outside the academic community tracking this, they don't know some of the really exciting things that we're doing, and they don't read the engineering, mechanical engineering magazine. <laughs> so we need to get into the mainstream media better. So anybody out there that's good at getting into the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, I think we're probably ready um, to do that. Uh, Resources, underwriting from industry and, and cooperation with NGOs is a big part of it, global organizations. Um, so these are all components that could provide resources, either uh, manpower, um, access, uh, partnerships. Um, and this is one that I think, uh, in, interesting, no one talked about World Bank or the IMF in any of our discussions so far, and that's their mission. That's why. <laughs> so why, why is that? You know, we, how do we break into that funding stream to do these 
very focused individual projects at in at the village level and start creating enterprises it's the different model than they typically fund but that doesn't mean we can't convince them to to change so that's a big that's a big challenge if you want to put a big C and a big B, big B and a big C that would be it but I think it's something we should look at because they have they have dollars then we tried to take a kind of holistic look at all of this and these being kind of the major challenges energy water food and ag and health and then the other things that intertwine on that that may not be a circle of their own um, so the challenges of distribution supply chain education housing communication infrastructure and enterprise creation so it came down to this this is a big systemic challenge and and for small projects you're chewing at a little tiny piece of that because that's all a small team can do but perhaps if we really want to address the the systemic issues you need to look at a project that really looks at you know all the pieces of this with the communication of research back and forth so correct me if I'm wrong for the last brainstorming team here but to take a look at a, at a significant grant that's centered on a, a city right or a, a, a real a rural region or maybe there's one of each of those <laughs> and looking at all of these you know what would be a research topic in energy and related to food and ag and water so we're good at doing the small parts but look at a coordinated one yes Matthew It's almost, you, you recreate it almost identically, the curriculum diagram that drives the engineering for developing communities program that I teach in. Like, that's it, right there. We did? Except oh, for government. Okay. It's the fifth wheel. Okay. Because if you're not getting that buy-in, then it's, right. it's going to go almost nowhere. Right. Right. Um, so my team, did I do all right? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we'll go with uh, group one. Thank you. And uh, group one, uh, you better stand up, right? You're going to support me up here. So I was the last one to duck, and that's why I I'm up here at the moment. And. Uh, as you can see, we had a hard time sort of condensing our ideas into one, one space, so we've got, we've got lots of paper here to talk about. Um, this you've seen before, so trying to get from sort of where we started yesterday in terms of our models or what we were thinking about in terms of extreme affordability down to something I think what we're really trying to do is talk to people who might have some money about letting us have some so that we could do what we think is important work so, so yes we can we can keep going what is in so it, it seemed like scope was important here and we tried to decide what is in we also had what is out, and then we crossed it out because we decided everything was in, but then we, <laughs> we brought back. So what is out is a sectarian approach. Everything else is fair game. Uh, what we think is important to articulate is that uh, we're, we're at some point talking about design and manufacturing. We think it's critical to incorporate not just technology but social political economic uh, community into the process at the beginning in the middle and at the end of the process so uh, an inclusive participatory approach um, we're trying to get to research and development 
So it's not just to do the basic science research, but to also have development be part of that. And that means uh, creating organizations, creating institutions, creating businesses to move things out. Um, so instead of an NSF sort of basic science model, maybe it's a combination. It's NSF and SBIR so that we can create create programs and including in that engineering, social science, again, all those, all those pieces that we think should be there. Needs, <laughs> yes, it says needs there. <laughs> um, Big problem, complex problems, uh, ecology is part of it, uh, and, and I'm using other people's words here. So blendability, compatibility, shareability, uh, incorporating cultural beliefs into what we're trying to do. So, We're trying to think about what's comparable, right? What, what sort of uh, uh, operations are there or, or what things are operationalized similar to what we might be trying to do. So one idea that, that came up was organic farming uh, in that you're trying to accomplish sort of tasty, healthy, sustainable, greener, lower entropy. We might come back to that. Oh. Zero entropy, well, we know that's not possible, but, you know, we can approach it. Um, fair trade, and we also talked about fair profit and the idea of spreading the benefits around so that it's ethical, accountable, just, shareable. Uh, sorry, we're, we're rushing here a little bit. There was something about thick connections here, and I think that ties in with the previous uh, presentation, just the idea that we need ways to establish thick connections with, with the people that we're working with uh, and finding ways to do that. So what's our value proposition? We're enhancing community building by developing adaptive solutions to facilitate economic improvements by delivering product quality. <laughs> so, I know, it just sort of goes on and on. The idea is we had some words up there that we thought were important. And so it was, it was community building, it was being adaptive, it was uh, economic improvements, it was quality products. Uh, resilience, rejuvenation, redeployment, uh, support assimilation, and context sensitivity, customization. We're trying to come up with a paragraph that might fit all those words in, and you heard the words, those are the things we're thinking about. We had lots of models about the relationships between things. So here's a three-pillar model where we have technology, institution, and culture. And this is where the words like blendability and compatibility and shareability, culture, sharing beliefs, and both informal and formal institutions being part of the integration. I feel like I'm giving you lots of lists here and not, not a clear picture of how they link together into a program. So let's kind of keep moving again. We went the three, the triangle to the pentagram uh, where we've got <laughs> economy and social political. This, we're saying again that we're trying to incorporate all these pieces back to triangles. Here's the two-dimensional approach where we have both analysis and action balanced on value, uh, life cycle, important considerations. And so 
I think you've heard the people, planet, and profit. The triple bottom line idea is one way to understand or even evaluate how well we're doing. I just I want to pause for a minute here and look around at my group and see if they yeah, are you waving at me? Do you have anything to say? To, you're waving in support. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is about supply chain and how do we actually deliver some of the things that we're talking about, the kinds of uh, dimensions that need to be part of the analysis, financial flows, information, and uh, material flows are our graphic display system here is starting to collapse, but uh, <laughs> st stick with me. Um, <laughs> this, this, let's give reference to Amy's pictures yesterday where we talked about going from one to many and scaling and how bringing that into the mix and we have between high and low scale and numbers of varieties of things that we can do, ways that different models fit into the picture. And here, this sound, sorry, this one sounds like NSF terminology. So this is our assessment framework for validation. Huh? Wow. <laughs> so here are some dimensions, institutional, technological, what resources, what are we doing about culture, access, assurance, ability, and skill, and can we, we've got check boxes there, so can we create programs where we can check off those boxes? So on the first day, there was something about disrupting the status quo and how we might do that. So reverse innovation to disrupt the status quo, thinking about design for the other 90%, uh, democratization of design, and sort of inclusive, participatory, or other words that are used, and uh, more fine-grained technology. It's a <laughs> thank you, a little support. A continuation uh, of these. What do we call them? We're gonna we're gonna disrupt things a little bit here with a horizontal supply chain versus vertical supply chain. Uh, change around the supplier and customer, uh, share resources in terms of, we're thinking about extreme affordability. So by sharing resources, you don't need so many of the pieces to actually deliver the service that you'd like to. Uh, <laughs> thank you, so this is our restaurant. We'd like you all to come because we're going to use local inputs, resources. We might use bartering. It'll definitely be authentic, uh, part of the culture. And uh, we thought the restaurant probably needed to have a goal. And uh, it might have been educational. It was, it was beyond just pure profit. Uh, branding, cre providing skills. Uh, Utilizing technology, again, trying to define these goals. A cooperative effort. So we're, we're going to operate. <laughs> It's going to operate by understanding the characteristics, the local characteristics, and provide services other than profits. For instance, education. What? We can skip. 
So what are the barriers to it? Uh, we have yet to succeed in changing the mindsets of the funders. Uh, not addressing motivators for resources. Sorry, I'm not quite getting that one. Not, we don't yet have a strong community to be able to operationalize it. So this meeting is an attempt to establish some of that community, but we need to be working on strengthening it. And lack of communications within the group, uh, between partners, uh, the high cost of doing things face to face and to establish these networks, if we don't do it face to face, it's, it's difficult to build the, those thick connections that we would like to have. Uh, it's hard to get people to fund the idea that we need face to face to build the networks. Um, and what it came down to was what we're trying to do really is build trust. And I think we haven't figured out a way to do that uh, across the network effectively. And another piece looked at, we're delivering technology in some sense, but usually it's not finished technology in the sense that it hasn't gone to far enough to become a product. It's still a, a something in development. It's still research and development. And so what do we need to do to get from that stage into actually having a product? So we brainstormed about some initiatives that we might undertake that might be interesting to funders. One was about reciprocal education and having partnerships where we, we co-develop curriculum, share students, use each of our communities as a laboratory for working together and for understanding the way both work and how they might work together in a synergistic way. Uh, we tried to articulate what the benefits were and how we might measure success. We talked about what research we might conduct. So education, research, might be research on an educational educational component. Uh, we would like to create some knowledge about what we're actually doing. Some other initiatives might include a micro venture innovation fund uh, to support people in the community developing technologies, services, ideas that could turn into businesses. Uh, venture some of these distinctions are subtle, and if you'd like to join our group, we can, we, we can, we can go into the discussion of the, the subtleties. But again, it was, it was trying to just brainstorm about the ways that we could articulate the benefits and measure the successes of different initiatives. So co-creation workshops. Uh, Here's a virtual one where we can database of virtualized learning. Uh, and then, again, finding ways to bring the sort of non-traditional pieces into the research and development process. That's it. So, sorry, that I, to me it felt like a real scattershot of of a lot of stuff, and I think that we, we approached some ideas that we think are important, and Mahesh, if we could have a couple more days together, <laughs> I, I think we could really get to somewhere. Absolutely, we'll be happy to host you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great, I think uh, now we'll go with uh, group three. Yes. <laughs> All right, while that is being set up, uh, if there are a few things that you'd like to talk about, a couple of minutes.
we have time. Now it's actually quite heartening to see uh, the density of ideas. Uh, clearly, you have brainstormed quite a bit, and uh, it, I mean, it's 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 wonderful to see that density of thinking and uh, frameworks that can come out of it. So, compliments to you, really. Thank you. I shall leverage that for density of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and the frugality of your frameworks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, and here is group three. Yeah, must be. Okay. So uh, what we've tried to do is put together a strategic plan of how NSF can become involved in research focused on emerging markets. And uh, we felt, uh, when we started talking yesterday, we felt it was important to redefine this term, research in extreme affordability. Because the word affordability, we felt, conveys just a, a monetary connection to the problem. And the problem extends much, much further than, than just making it low cost. You know, you have to make it context appropriate. You have to understand the cultural factors, uh, dissemination factors. So we felt that what we're actually trying to do here is design, develop, and deliver technologies for underserved communities that happen to live in highly constrained environments. And, and that's where our D3 named comes from, design, developing, and delivering. And we define highly constrained environments as areas where we have limited scientific and engineering experience and knowledge and where the environments impose uh, constraints be due to economic factors, social factors, uh, cultural factors, or economic factors. Um, so you have to take all of that into account when designing these technologies. So our motivation in doing research in this space is that we can understand the social and scientific factors behind the problems that face underserved communities and the interaction of those scientific and social factors. And we can solve problems with a life or death level of impact. So, so huge impact of our scientific work. And we can add scientific and engineering rigor to the development of technologies focused on this space. And through this process, we can both advance applied research, but also mine core research and extract it out and apply it to these contexts. Also through this process, what we can do is engage emerging markets with U.S. industry. And what that does is it helps develop our U.S. workforce uh, uh, to understand um, how to develop products in emerging markets and, uh, and extend our U.S. industry into those markets and, uh, and, and engage the customers in those markets so we can grow U.S. industry. Um, furthermore, we can develop technologies maybe starting in this space, focused on emerging markets, but any technology that's cheaper, more robust, easier to manufacture, is going to be cross-culturally applicable. So we can hopefully uh, transfer it back to U.S. Context, uh, context and globally. And finally, in an educational context, we can create global engineers. And, and we can train them on all the, the factors that go into developing technology for emerging markets. And like I was talking about earlier today, um, make, uh, create engineers that can travel anywhere in the globe and immediately uh, innovate with local talent and, and understand all the local factors that, that affect technological development. So we feel that these goals align with NSF's goals. In, um, and we're trying to position this, this uh, strategic plan within NSF's uh, uh, initiative and in, in, in goals. So NSF wants to establish uh, the U.S. as a global leader in fundamental and transformative science and engineering. And I think if we're, if we're solving life or death uh, type level of impact problems, that would definitely put us in, the, in that position. Um, and, and these type of technologies are going to have an impact on industrial development and general welfare, hopefully maybe starting in the developing world, but globally, as we transfer the technology globally. Um, this, these type of problems will foster the interchange between scientists and engineers in the U.S. 
and obviously in foreign countries. Um, and as we grow these type of programs, I think we will, uh, will create the U.S. as a central clearinghouse to provide information and policy formation on tech, uh, technology focused on emerging markets. Um, and, uh, and, and these type of programs will, will obviously support uh, scientific and engineering activities rela related to international cooperation. And that, uh, that ties in very well with, with our approach in doing all of this. So we felt that it's, it, and I think this has been a consensus here over the last two days, it's so important to engage local stakeholders and really leverage the talents uh, uh, of people who will use this technology and who intimately understand the context in which the technology will be used. So we, we term that genetic uh, evolution of a technology, you know, using the, the properties inherent to the local environment to create the new technologies. And we see that with, uh, with these local innovators that Amy has talked about a lot this, uh, this weekend. And then I think that the talents that we bring to these problems are, we, we call uh, the prosthetic approach. So we're, we're coming in from the outside, but we're bringing in engineering talent and experience and, and hopefully the power of manufacturing distribution of the U.S. industry. And when you combine those together, we call that the bionic approach, right? So we're genetic, prosthetic, and we're creating something greater than either of the two uh, operating alone. Um, as far as our approach with NSF uh, in, in developing the strategic plan, I think first we need to align with uh, NSF's goals and, and, and align this plan with the life cycle of developing technologies for emerging markets. And by doing that, we can, uh, we can identify how, this, how our approach aligns with NSF, NSF's goals, but also see how we can expand NSF's goals and vision uh, to, to encompass this, this program. Um, and then also we can help NSF connect with funders and other organizations that can support these type of programs. So uh, I've talked a lot about industry and how they could pump money into these programs to help create technologies. I think there's opportunities to, to uh, combine venture, fund, uh, venture uh, capital, microfinance, uh, to help disseminate technologies. Um, obviously, if we're doing research, engaging universities in, in the intellectual and human capital we bring, both here and in, de in developing countries. Um, engaging, as Liz mentioned, the World Bank on the IMF in, in helping funding these programs in, in disseminating technology, as well as NGOs. Um, maybe exploring research and NGO hybrids in the Poverty Action Lab is a, is a good example of this. They do research on developing countries, but they also run an NGO to help enact their findings and, uh, and help them coordinate their field trials. Um, possibly using royalties from licensed products that, that are uh, sold in developing countries to help support research focused on this. Um, and, and maybe exploring Kiva type models to fund research. So you have individual investors in, uh, investing in the, in the development of technology for emerging markets. And then finally, uh, we outlined the process that we thought these type of projects would follow in their development. So the first stage would be market discovery, and that would be getting the, the, the crucial on-the-ground perspective of, of how this technology needs to be used and all the factors that are going to be uh, relevant uh, to, to its success and, and really understanding the constraints of the environment. And then you enter into the research process, and that may be core research. If you're talking about something like air quality in Nairobi, you know, there's, there's science behind why the air quality is as it is and, and how it affects people, but also applied science and in, 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 in thinking about technologies that can improve um, these, these uh, uh, tremendous social problems that affect emerging markets and, and going into the pr applied research process of development and prototyping, field trialing, and then not stopping there and, and making sure that you scale this technology all the way to dissemination. So scaling it up, launching the product, um, maybe initially in the, in the local country, but again trying to explore cross-cultural applicability in uh, dissemination, and then seeing how that affects policy. So, so how, how can we sway governments to implement these technologies uh, and, and help uh, scale them on a larger scale? So that, uh, that's the rundown of our strategic plan, and uh, thanks very much. All righty. Uh, move on to group four, and that is, you know who you are then.
Yeah, we're going to be over here. I think Noah's going to just, uh, we have a human-powered uh, presentation. Um, Anil uh, liked uh, the poem I uh, wrote ye yesterday so much that I'm just going to riff another poem and Amy's going to just act it out with her clay figurines. We hope that that's okay. I mean, is that, is that right? okay, get going, Amy, quick. Produce. <laughs> get those hands going. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, this is us, Amy, Noha, uh, 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 Barbara, and myself. We kicked out um, Sam. He kept referring to Gordon Gecko, so we um, got him out. Um, extreme affordability, uh, uh, th we thought that that could uh, uh, be an area that's ripe for research, uh, but uh, we thought that maybe excludes some um, activities and some people. Uh, and so maybe it should be looked at a little bit. Um, certain technologies aren't included, maybe certain markets. Um, some finance mechanisms and some disciplines, um, and one suggestion uh, might be to instead call it accessible impact. Thank you, Barbara. Fantastic. Um, we were asked to think about some value propositions, so what makes this uh, uh, good stuff for the NSF and other research funding agencies to think about? Um, maybe it helps um, uh, uh, agencies and universities uh, possibly with student recruitment and retention. Um, uh, maybe we need to think about um, reverse innovation. How does going over there help us to come back here and think about what's going on here in the United States or in the states some of us live in a little bit differently? Um, so reverse innovation uh, might uh, make these things more relevant to um, U.S.-based funding agencies because we're ultimately trying to get back here to look at what's going on. Um, we think we might be able to um, argue for some impact on, on energy and sustainability. And um, we think that um, hmm. uh, there's some um, uh, issues in the United States with uh, many city, county, state, and the national government having problems with deficits and other things going on, shrinking cities, population movements, even, even in the United States. So how might this help us start to think a little bit about the self-reliance going on in much of the world? How do we bring some of those self-reliant models or patterns or behaviors possibly back to the United States? Um, areas of research. Um, these are um, areas of research that we think the NSF might be already interested in or they might be somewhat understood by funding agencies and so um, maybe these become categories that we pay some attention to as um, we're putting together um, uh, requests for funding that makes sense to us but also makes sense to the, some of the funding agencies. Um, that might have to do with um, energy storage and low-cost uh, solar, um, repurposing waste streams, uh, patterns, uh, knowledge, uh, and uh, uh, manufacturing uh, technologies from the developing world. We might, uh, Kevin Klinger phrase, uh, interrogate some materials here um, and look at uh, the u alternative uses for some of our standard materials. Um, this, uh, we might look at mobile telephony, biometrics, biomimetics, I'm sorry, personal manufacturing fabrication, nanotechnology, sustainable agriculture, and paper-based diagnostics. We're trying to identify um, categories of research that operate at a, probably a high level, not undergraduate or maybe not even master's degree, but looking at more PhD areas of studies. And uh, uh, um, areas of research continued might include in the agricultural area, we might be looking at biofuels, uh, nutrient capture, uh, saltwater crops, climate impact, weather on demand. Um, Amy and you were supposed to like jump in with stories and cases and things. I'm doing such a great job. Okay. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Ethics, uh, growing uh, pharmaceuticals, and bioremediation. Uh, you know, we're almost done. Uh, energy, we think, might be a good research topic. Of course, uh, talking about uh, energy storage, uh, batteries and these sorts of things, low-cost solar, thermoelectric uh, uh, insulation, building materials, transmission of energy across long distances, and maybe wave power. Uh, underwater, um, uh, we talked about low-cost desalinization, uh, transport mechanisms for water in rural communities and other parts of the world, and industrial wet water uh, reuse. Yeah, uh, we also thought that um, this uh, is uh, a lot of what we ha a lot of us are fairly entrepreneurial. We're almost l lone workers in our, a particular topic or maybe we're one or two people among, at, a, at a particular university. 
Um, and so that, uh, and this coming together like this uh, feels really good, I think, for, or at least for the four of us. Um, Sam left us again, you know. So, uh, um, but, um, so we think there's a need to start to use a conference like this and a, and a coming together like this as a way to create some of our own infrastructure um, to sort of foster this sort of activity further. And where might we look to create a, a kind of a the, uh, uh, extreme affordability uh, infrastructure? Uh, 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 so we might look at um, funding agencies and, and start to encourage them to think about multidisciplinary committees or appointments um, that review um, grant applications, drawing from a number of um, interrelated, related fields. Um, we might ask questions about the NSF directorate, right, um, to maybe include, a, to create a new one, a new directorate for the NSF. Um, this is a blue sky thinking here. Um, includes a representation from a government aid agency. Um, maybe um, funding agencies not only uh, start, uh, keep funding high level research, but they start to create maybe a new category or a sensibility about the importance of an including implementation ideas and supporting implementation because a lot of the 20 by 20s were talking about things that we're actually doing on the ground. Um, how do we uh, uh, create incentives uh, for local universities that are outside the United States to work on their local problems uh, and, and, um, and, and conduct local research? Again, to talk a little bit differently about this uh, new infrastructure that we imagine um, it might start to involve professional organizations. Um, existing high-level journals might start to include um, uh, specific categories of uh, research being done by other researchers at other universities around the world. Uh, uh, that we might start to create like the, uh, probably like the MacArthur, um, like the Aga Khan uh, Prize, like the Curry Stone Design Prize, we might start to um, create uh, uh, a sort of prize, funded prizes, to give the work of someone who may not be that well known uh, a, a tremendous uh, uh, legitimacy um, in the larger realm and maybe some financial dollars to, to, do, to, to do their work. Um, we might start to think about other avenues or other sorts of publications, maybe that's um, you know, we talk about this somewhat at my university when we talk about tenuring and promotion. How is it only the case that we should be looking at books and the highest level peer-reviewed publications when we know that the world of sharing ideas and sharing knowledge is getting much more complicated and much richer and much more socially based? So how do we start getting at that um, with the, with, and, how, and this conference is doing that, this workshop, in fact. And um, uh, finally, standards and, no, what is this? Yeah, and member engagement. What does that mean? I can't remember. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, how do we start to engage members better uh, than maybe we have? And maybe, again, this workshop's a good example of trying to, trying to foster that. And how do we, maybe as I just made a mention of how we share uh, knowledge and information, how do we start to rethink these conventions and traditions and standards because some of what's going on here by all of us in the room is very challenging to the status quo and to what's, uh, what's imagined and anticipated and expected of all of us. Infrastructure again, uh, maybe uh, segueing into academic institutions. Uh, you know, uh, our sense is that um, uh, uh, we're, we're here sharing and that maybe there's an opportunity to create a more structured way to share even something as, syllabi, as simple as, a, as syllabi or as a particular course exercise. That the, uh, I think we're here as a group of inclusive people. We're not looking to shut each other out from engaging whatever it is that we're working on. And um, as academics, maybe that's not so um, common in academia and it's a, a wonderful dynamic that's in this room certainly. Um, maybe we develop more experiential learning models with each other. Um, it's, uh, it's, I've heard the, like the Harvard business case studies referred to several times over the, 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 these two days. And maybe there's a chance to, um, we have a, a lot of what we see I think through the social media and we saw it today and even my 20 by 20 was like that. Um, where there's a lot of interesting small projects going on around the world. Uh, but they're really presented, and even I do this, as a kind of quick overview of here's a really interesting piece of work, here are some key ideas, etc., and boom, and then on to another one. How might we try to go in and do some much more rigorous case studies? We're talking here again about 
uh, operating at the level of uh, doctoral writing and researching uh, students. How might we get, uh, and we have people from the business community and, and business academia here, how might we start to do more rigorous case studies that dimensionalize these uh, small projects that are going on in other parts of the world and treat them in the same way that the Harvard uh, Business School would treat the case studies that they develop. Uh, and um, maybe uh, uh, this is a difficult thing, I come from the academic world, but um, how might we um, foster or encourage multidisciplinary chairs or faculty positions on faculty bodies? Uh, and finally, um, we um, uh, uh, said, what are some, uh, you know, threats? Um, what are some of the big issues? What are some of these uh, uh, pressure points? What are, th what's the third rail? What are some of the third rail issues? Um, y you know, uh, uh, do the sponsoring organizations uh, really want to listen, uh, or, or are we just uh, busy telling others what they should be doing, what, what, what we could call cultural arrogance? Is that still present in, 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 uh, in the organizations, the institutions, the funding agencies, the people who are at the top of these, those pyramids? Um, uh, is there a kind of arrogance there that's going to um, make this very, a di very difficult project, in fact? Um, uh, uh, do uh, sponsoring, uh, uh, we sort of forgot this to fill this out, do sponsoring organizations really value, uh, is, that would cause them to invest in, in the work that we're doing? Uh, thank you, Barbara. And um, mm, uh, we talked about this m maybe uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, what's, the, what's the bridge for the, the, the dissertation writing students, for the students who are graduating from a professional degree program, even for students who are in undergraduate programs in the United States who want to know what good graduate program they should go to to work on a master's degree. What are those, um, what are those opportunities to move from being a source for free labor to support faculty energies and projects out in the world to actually find income earning potentials and positions? Um, so that they can both have a livelihood and pay off their student loans and do all those sorts of regular things um, because there doesn't seem to be many, many of those sorts of bridges that exist. Um, and I think that's um, anything you want to act out there? Any little thing? Oh, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, it's uh, group five. Uh, that's your group. Hello, everybody. So we're group five, and we're going last. The pleasure and fear of going last. Um, so I just wanted to introduce my group to you. It's George, Kathy, who is not here. Kathy, by virtue. Matthew. Where's he? Oh my God, you're right here. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> I thought I was going to be alone. Theme and my. And uh, we left the bulk of our sheets of writing on the wall for you all to admire in, a, essence, a graffiti wall outside over there in the other room. But what we want to share with you was basically a synthesis of some common challenges and themes that we found coming up over and over over the course of uh, these two days. Um, oh, okay. Well, this one's warm already, so that's nice. Thank you, Wes. Um, so. <laughs> So at the top here, we have some of our challenges that we uh, have established, and I think these are quite common to everything else that we've heard so far. And specifically, in terms of the challenges to uh, the research, um, sorry, to uh, opportunities in research and materials and um, manufacturing and for extreme affordability are monitoring and evaluation, knowledge sharing, interdisciplinary collaboration, the role of students, and risk. And we feel that the potential partnership framework for creating solutions to these challenges and nothing here that's uh, revolutionary, but the interdisciplinary relationship between academia, industry, and NGOs, and government. So I think we're going to share the responsibility of reporting on this. So uh, for monitoring and evaluation, some of the challenges that we identified had to definitely do with the incentives and rewards um, that are available based on sound assessment of, of uh, long-term research projects. Um, what drives these research projects um, and how are they, is that, how is that framed within the NSF? Um, in addition to that, we felt that 
appropriate timelines are a definite challenge that we need to address and that NSF funding incentives have to consider or reconsider a different type of life cycle analysis. Um, working with foreign nationals and local partners is definitely something that we felt was a barrier right now in terms of the NSF structure um, and ownership. Oh, sorry. Uh, the ownership of the process, and again, it's more on the local level, is something that is not necessarily brought to the forefront and we felt should be emphasized. And ultimately, success measures. Um, this is something that is a real big challenge in terms of this kind of research work. What are our success measures and are they appropriate? Do they need to be adjusted in order to drive the right kind of results? So we our form here, our format for present presenting is challenges first, followed by some rough ideas on solutions. Um, probably not as rigorous as all of this, but we did our best. Um, so for monitoring and evaluation, uh, some of the solutions we addressed in terms of, I have to look back, um, of our, it's back forth. for incentives and rewards, uh, what we felt would be appropriate is to add additional impact or uh, expand on the impact model for NSF uh, application evaluations. So incorporating factors like the notion of global impact and the life cycle assessment aspect. Um, the other kind of very specific uh, recommendation we wanted to make is that there needs to be a clarification of NSF and USAID um, memorandum of understanding for international work. Um, our, our coined term for this event is the notion of slow engineering. And this kind of feeds back into uh, those adjusted success measures. What do we define as success? And what kind of timeline is driven by that success measure? And okay, right, on to the next. Um, so initially we had split knowledge sharing and interdisciplinary collaboration. However, as we talk through it more and more, we realize that really they, they kind of go together. One is not independent of the other. They're very codependent. So um, the challenges that uh, are to bo barriers to knowledge sharing, we felt were language across disciplines and of course speaking languages, cultural uh, challenges in terms of uh, language, uh, community languages, technology, uh, disciplines twice because we felt it was so important, um, the notions of intellectual property and ultimately choice of media. So how and what we say and how and where we say it is really critical in terms of uh, driving um, more development. So uh, some of our solutions that we proposed, some of the ideas that we discussed, and they were actually right before us. Thank you for summarizing them so nicely. Um, interdisciplinary education is something that we felt had to be introduced early on. Um, we talk about interdisciplinary collaboration moving forward and it has to be prevalent throughout. Uh, some new modes of knowledge dissemination. So how do we go beyond reports? Haikus is one way, uh, case studies, definitely another, white papers, a visualization of information. Um, we understand that you do drive towards more academic papers, but how do you also create um, information that is digestible to multiple disciplines where you start to kind of move away from the jargon and create information that is immediately digestible? Um, New models for IP ownership is something that we felt was critical, it's something that might be of interest to NSF to integrate. An integration of local knowledge um, early on. So um, that, um, oh, oh, sorry, had a, had a bridge in my mind. And of course, uh, ultimately all of this leads towards this part of technical literacy. We felt that that was an undervalued aspect and needed to be kind of put up front as a value. Um, role of students. Um, uh, great, sure. Um, I told, mentioned this a couple times and some of you may know of it otherwise, but the Royal Institute of British Architects issued a report this week on the future of architects. And maybe it was two weeks ago. Um, just on the very front page of their uh, executive summary, um, they make some startle or make some Im important points and statistics that drove the nature of this report. First is a quote. It's a quote from an architect. He says, in 10 years, we will probably not call ourselves an architecture practice. It will be something else entirely. So just the idea that they're going to be architects may be an obsolete idea. Uh, global population growth in the next 50 years or 40 years will be 46%. 70% of the people on the planet will live in an urban area by 2050. This is really startling to me. Infrastructure construction growth. 
128% in emerging markets, 18% in the developed communities. In, that's in, by 2020. That's in the next 10 years. And finally, the share of global construction by 2020. In emerging markets, it will be 55% of the total uh, on the globe. And so I think as, as educators, we need to be thinking, well, where, where are our students going to be working and what types of projects will they be constructing? So more people, bigger cities, more construction. And I think that the Royal Institute of British Architects is traditionally a very conservative organization, obviously, and for them to come out with statements, pretty bold statements like this, is an indicator that perhaps for many of us, this is the cutting edge in terms of global, uh, global thinking for our students. Well said, sir. So to that point, uh, one of some of the challenges that we identified working through uh, as a group was uh, the challenge of evaluating the learning outcomes of some of this work for students, graduate students, um, undergrads, all of them. Chal um, evaluation of performance long term uh, after graduation and that goes to the point of what's next upon graduation and how are the students applying this work, what's driving further innovation, uh, the channeling of positive energy into the work, um, cultural preparation, n the notion of the greater need for the submersion of uh, students in advance of entering this, uh, the kind of work that we're looking at here building the capacity of the student body as well as their skills, and translating educational experience into professional opportunities, again, a recurring theme uh, that we've heard. And uh, we had our, our lovely scribe contribute some uh, thoughts as well in terms of um, some of the apathy that's been experienced by some of our, um, our group as well from the students, rather than sometimes enthusiasm, actual apathy and fear, and risk aversion as a consequence. So some of the solutions that address uh, these potential challenges um, are, are an agreed upon framework of evaluation for and by stakeholders, something that where various educational institutions, um, and perhaps the NSF as well, uh, could drive funding towards this, this framework for evaluation. Um, with a necessary feedback loop from the students. And it, uh, notions of outbound programming to learn about culture. So um, one of the ones that we also added to all of this was uh, students to student mentoring. So having the students that are doing this work already engage other students and something that Amos is already doing by teaching the course at MIT um, in uh, the wheelchairs is exactly the kind of framework and exactly the kind of model that we should see repeated more often in other educational institutions. Of course, the advocacy of professional associations uh, such as the ones you see here and collaborative educational uh, and university partnerships. And finally, risk. Uh, I think you should do this one because there's some uh, stuff in here that you guys have wrote that's pretty challenging. So we think that risk is one of the big challenges for universities and probably for NSF as well, obviously. So among the things that are causing the challenges are the lawyers, um, profit models, uh, uncertainty. So if we don't know what's, what to expect, we're afraid that we might not know what, what to do. And then tenure and promotion for faculty is a, a, a concern or a challenge. So some of the solutions, obviously, quoting Shakespeare, kill the lawyers. At first we kill the lawyers. And I, I highly recommend that, but I'm going to leave it to others to take care of it. Um, we need to identify um, key university administration who will be supportive of types of international work that we are proposing to do um, because they can create the, the bunker that faculty can hide in. Um, and you need to educate the administration on exactly what it is doing so that they aren't afraid of risk or they think that, or that they know that they can trust that you'll be competent and responsible in the field. Um, so you need, need to educate them and seek their support. Um, and then you need to learn from other uh, universities, obviously. Uh, D-Lab and the program at Stanford are, are great models for all of us to learn from. Um, and then finally, we need to identify the risks and analyze the impact that they'll have on a potential project. And the, that work needs to be in advance. You need to do your homework before you bring 18-year-olds uh, to Guatemala. Right, that's it. Excellent. I think uh, that's, that's just very heartening and phenomenal uh, set of ideas and frameworks. So. A lot of fodder there for our discussion to begin. Um, 
we have uh, about 45 minutes uh, of discussion time, which is fantastic. So let's have at it. And if you would like to speak, just raise your hand and uh, the volunteers, if you could help us with the mics, that will be great. I have a question, um, Mahesh, I guess to you. Can you describe what happens after this workshop and, and how we go about sure. articulating all of this to NSF? After the workshop, I'm going to go home and relax tomorrow and play with the kids. <laughs> Uh, seriously, I think uh, that's probably the daunting um, and uh, challenging step. Uh, clearly, we have to articulate um, these thoughts and frameworks to NSF with the goal of making a difference. And uh, what that is, we don't know. I think it probably will take some time to actually digest. And uh, our initial thoughts uh, were to... Um, to initiate a participatory process of some sort uh, where we do involve larger community and uh, as we frame this and as we have already engaged the larger community but for the larger community perhaps uh, to seek feedback and uh, gain, uh, gain support and buy in uh, from larger community. Those are some of the thoughts but uh, Shekhar and Noha please by all means, jump in and share your thoughts about what are the next steps. I think to keep it at a pretty tactical level, I think the first thing, uh, again, I'm thinking in real time here, so, is to collect all this data because the data has come in from so many different places, from so many different angles. I think the biggest challenge is to take that piece of information, all those pieces of information, and build a story around it. Is it going to be a strategic plan? I, I don't know. Is it going to be a set of frameworks? I don't know. Is it going to be a set of, hey, here are the initiatives and here is what you fund? I don't know. But I think there are a lot of good ideas. And I think once you piece them and then kind of go and really ask the question, what are you addressing? Because NSF has funds for education, NSF has funds for research. Then as Chris pointed out in our team, DSBIR has another. So there are several ways to kind of pitch and position this. And so some of that has got to be thought through. And it's just not going to be, uh, you know, uh, just you know, Mahesh, Noha, and I, is, what we're going to do is at least the, the thing that I am thinking through and piggybacking on what Mahesh said is, we'll collect all this information, put a straw person together, engage the larger community to kind of say, hey, this makes sense, this does not make sense, tweak it further, and then get to a point where, you know, there's a reasonable amount of comfort uh, and go from there. Is that? Does that give some idea of what's next? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Yes, I mean, we, uh, in fact, uh, as a PI and co-PI um, and as a co-chair, uh, we, we are responsible for putting that together. That does not mean I would be writing or he would be writing entirely, but uh, uh, at least uh, responsible to coordinate this whole effort. Yeah. Uh, definitely make a case to NSF that uh, this is a worthwhile and uh, uh, not just worthwhile, but uh, something that you just cannot afford to ignore. And I do use that pun intentionally. So um, I'm curious what opportunities are there to keep the conversation going around this table because there's such a wealth of expertise in the room uh, that has had so much to do with sh uh, shaping this, uh, this dialogue. It, it seems like uh, that most everyone at the table might be willing to continue the conversation. So are there some uh, some real... Uh, and I don't know what that is, you know, but, um, but some real uh, uh, ways that we can all commit to, uh, uh, to continuing the conversation. And another question, will this report be, it be passed around to this committee in draft form so we can make comments? Absolutely. Well, I think part of this is, is again, how do we operationalize this? So it's sort of following up on Kevin's question and saying that can part of what happens after being B, developing this network so that we can continue to fairly easily collaborate? 
Yeah, I think uh, that's where engineering for change uh, is a platform which could facilitate that. But I mean, that, that's something that we talked actively about. Uh, that is the thing to test out and uh, and utilize to enable operationalizing our case, which is a first step. <laughs> but also to build a community. I think uh, community building, as uh, we have seen in the last two days, uh, has been an integral part of our objectives, so uh, that will continue. I think this is just the beginning, obviously. Noha. Okay. Um, I think it's also created an incredible precedent that we can use moving forward when we're applying for re uh, funding with NSF. You say, well, it, as a reflection of the Remia workshop. It was clearly discerned that there was lots of opportunity and even responsibility to do, be doing work in these markets. And now when we start to apply, we can refer to the workshop and say, well, as a participant and, and as indicated by the outcomes, here's, here's what we want to do. And it can't be, I don't think, yet the sole justification for the work, but it certainly is going to add a bullet to the chamber of getting a grant. Let me let me pose a question to this audience, and I just, want to, I just want to piggyback on what Kevin said. One deliverable clearly is this report to the NSF, but what I'm also hearing is, based on this network that was created, there could be other engagement mechanisms that one could think of, whether it's in the short term or the long term. And I'm just posing this question to the community at large here. What are some of the ideas you might have that you believe are some of those engagement mechanisms that will either help us exchange knowledge or work towards some end goal. I don't know. I'm just posing that here. If that's any ideas, thoughts? This is a great start. You know, I think this opportunity is much, much bigger than, than uh, NSF. Uh, uh, to start with, and NSF certainly has some programs that in pockets can support it. And, and uh, so I sort of was thinking of polymorphism. You know, this report comes out, they put different wrappers for it, and it can be sold to different uh, types of organizations. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you know, I'm sure there'll be certain smaller proposals that may come out. But I think it's important for us to think much bigger than, than NSF. And there's a lot at stake in terms of the kinds of issues uh, that, that this addresses. And if you get to that level of thinking, you know, we have, of course, here um, uh, IEEE, ASME representation, and, and uh, engineers for change, and, uh, you know, and we can go much beyond that, engineers without borders and so on. But I think there's huge, um, huge uh, value for this uh, for multiple stakeholders. Uh, and and, and, uh, you know, and, and I think we, we weren't even able to list, list all of them. Uh, it includes um, all, all kinds of um, uh, organizations as well as uh, companies and industries because they could test a lot of interesting future business models uh, and so on and so forth. So I think this is this is something that we should we should think about seriously. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll get a million dollar grant and so on, and each of us will get seventy thousand or whatever, and and a couple of students, ASME, will have some impact, and that will be the end of it in three years. Uh, so we should think bigger than that. So what are the BHAGs that come out of this? <laughs> what are the big, hairy, audacious goals that uh, you have been thinking, contemplating? So if I go to page 11 of this wonderful book that was put out, at the bottom of the uh, left-hand paragraph or left-hand column, the main objectives of this NSF workshop are to identify new and important opportunities for research and design in radically affordable solution development and manufacturing. Examine how recent advances in engineering, social science, and design can be employed in or adapted to our focus areas. And identify fundamental research needs, design and development challenges, and knowledge gaps. The results of the workshop with will pave the way to make a proposal to the National Science Foundation to allocate strategic space and continuous funding for the research in the area of extreme affordability. I read that. We have done the first step. There is another step which is that NSF funding request, and there's a big step between what we have done here, which is very good, a good first step, and identifying the specific things that, that fundal, fundamental uh, 
uh, research uh, request uh, um, would be would uh, would be for. Um, I think one of the things that hopefully the committee will do in the report is it sounds like NFS, NSF has traditionally and continues to do the, the research part of it, but we all know it's the deployment. Y we're going beyond just the, the research part and the, the much more difficult, challenging, exciting, um, you know, actually getting to the, to the locations where we want to go. So it, it, does NSF even have that charter to, to do that kind of funding? And if they don't, how are they going to bridge that gap? That's, that's an excellent question. That's exactly the question to pose. And somebody. Yeah, I think that's one of our BHAGs, right, is that it's, uh, it is an issue, these ideas of implementation grants and to try to, um, to change a, um, a funding structure which has primarily funded things in the lab to get a funding for taking things out of the lab. And I think when you look at what are, what are the things that are fundamentally tremendously large changes, um, you know, it won't happen quickly, but I think that it, there needs to be some things that are long-term goals, and I think that that's, that's one of them because um, this research is essentially, um, uh, it has at its core the applicability in the world, and if you don't get it out into the world, then that sort of is, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, undercutting the whole point of the research. And so I, I think that trying to see if there's a way to uh, make sure that mechanisms are in place for that to happen is something that will be a long road, but it's important to do. I agree. I, there's a uh, new memorandum of understanding between National Science Foundation and the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I think that might be a vehicle or a conduit to be able to do more applied research um, moving forward, but the way that the, the, the mechanism by which that MOU is going to be Im implemented is still under discussion. So nobody knows how it works because nobody's ever done it. So they're still negotiating how the funding will, will actually operate and what the rules will be. But I, I think this is a, a perfect, again, this is, a, this is a, a tool, this is this conference, this workshop is a lever that we can use to push that discussion in a way that would benefit our own self-interest. Yeah. Uh, I would like to share two thoughts which come to my mind. One, that excessive emphasis on lab to land may dwarf the real gain which will come from land to lab to land. In other words, learning from people, recalibrating our concepts and theories, and then going back to people might be much more meaningful. I also mention this because we have had a long debate in India for the last 20 years on lab to land. Extension science came out of that. You know, huge number, of, huge amount of literature came up on that. And sometimes the funds for extension were more than funds for research, which might look paradoxical, but that's a true, that is a fact of Indian uh, science, agriculture science at least. So we don't want that kind of pendulum to swing to that extent, but at the same time, if science gets reorganized itself, if the new heuristics come in, if we constrain our imagination by material limits so that we work towards extreme affordability by producing good science, not by using existing science and then applying it in a some kind of an intermediate technology framework. I think we should not reinvent intermediate technology. That was not a very nice concept. That was not a very useful concept. It didn't go very far, actually, because it implied that for poor people, you could have something suboptimal. Whereas none of us here is talking about suboptimality. We're talking about the possible optimal designs using the best science and the best knowledge and culture and values and so on. So I think we need to be careful about historical load of certain words and certain concepts, which will be recalled by reviewers when you use that language, and I think we should not get into that trap. Okay, I think I <coughs> also agree this has been a great start, and I echo uh, that the opportunities are much broader than NSF. But if one objective is to really reach out to NSF, this was an NSF-funded workshop, 
uh, our, and our goals are to enhance uh, the funding portfolio, uh, we really have to have a very crisp ask, uh, or at least one of the <coughs> uh, objectives or a section of the report should be a very crisp uh, definition, which would require us then to see what existing programs NSF has. Uh, there are several uh, current initiatives under which several of these things could be funded, and maybe the directors would come back. Those who are familiar with NSF, it's a battle to really uh, loosen the money. So I think we need to also look at initiatives that have been very successful, at least in providing resources, like the National Nanotechnology Initiative. If the National Nanotechnology Initiative could you know, be raised to a congressional level allocation, we really need to think along those lines. And uh, while I know it's really <coughs> reaching for the star, we need to do that. This is, there is no greater problem uh, that uh, humanity f uh, faces today. So we need to really package it and have a very forceful statement uh, that we need to address this global challenge. It covers all these areas. We saw that energy, water, environment. Uh, and I think I duplicate that we have to, there is a need for basic science. We don't want to go and change NSF's mission. I mean, they, it'll never succeed. So what we need to communicate is basic science will really help uh, attain these uh, uh, solutions. So that's my two penny. Yeah, I just had a, a, a comment. I mean, I, I've, I've served on uh, one of... Uh, NSF's advisory board for for continue to serve for for three for over three years. Uh, it's a little different mission from the core NSF. It's the Industrial Innovation and Partnerships Program, uh, all the SBIR, SCTR, um, Partnership for Innovation, and several other programs, um, Goli and so on, come under that. Uh, that said, they they will they will be closely interested in in this uh, this kind of a thing. And 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 if this is uh, tightly wrapped, they they do fund some. Uh, outside special initiatives, and, and uh, you know, we funded one, I think, uh, to MIT, to MIT Forum to help other small businesses um, create networks and teams and go forward with that. It was close to a um, couple of million dollars, I think, and it, it's ongoing. Uh, I, so th I see the potential for something like that happening from this. I think it may be a good start, and 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 uh, you know, perhaps the leadership team here um, and and some of uh, some of the people that can package it, as you pointed out, crisply, uh, and, and uh, come up with a core proposition uh, to how it will benefit future U.S. businesses, uh, it, it, can, it, can add, it can add significant value. I think if that value proposition is, is, uh, uh, is made clear, uh, there may be one angle. There are several other angles. You know, there's goalies and several others. Uh, but I think beyond, beyond that, I think there's, I feel that we have to come up with a strategy for, for um, uh, getting this funded in other, other shapes which are much bigger. Excellent question of strategy. Lou? Yeah, um, NSF is important and we thank them for funding this, uh, a chance for all of us to get together and we'll give them a report. But NSF is not the only person out there or group out there. We've seen a lot of ideas generated here, a lot of good focus areas, uh, a lot of cross-discipline possibilities and impact areas. And, and also ideas on how to operate um, and carry things out through. So we don't have to wait for NSF. I'm hoping s some of the results here will go home and will actually work on starting some of this work. Um, uh, we want, uh, do, is, is, are we going to publicize the results beyond NSF? I'd like to get, get this out to a broader range of people, if at all possible. And NSF tends to be U.S. oriented. We've talked about U.S. Uh, focus. Uh, this is international and I think we need some way to get the, the message out of what we're talking about around the world to people who can help at local areas uh, uh, outside of the U.S. where perhaps U.S. can help and perhaps there will be other people who will be involved in it. John? Uh, we, in our group, uh, which uh, was the PowerPoint that Amos presented, we took a very pragmatic approach to this issue and perhaps we took a little bit of a different angle to it. But th our approach was to create a business plan that would uh, identify what the ROI is for NSF. And um, because at the end of the day, um, we, we looked at fund, uh, uh, funding organizations like NSF and others as corporations that uh, need to be pitched in order for them to give us money. So um, in, in our basic infrastructure, and we've talked a lot about it, uh, we, again, we looked at, the, at, at, each, at, at this 
at this meeting and how we would uh, potentially create a report um, and then the report itself would be a model by how we would uh, seek specific funding for different projects. So we, look, we looked at a, at a life cycle of a product and we looked at the life cycle of, of what it is that we're talking about from a broader perspective. So um, we, we believe we, we have at least a part of um, a solution. To, uh, to addressing this issue. Again, we took a very business, uh, business plan approach to it. Uh, would you like to add to any of this? Yeah, I think um, a part of this is, is showing that anybody funding this type of work is not going to, to lose any return on their investment that they would get funding conventional research programs or conventional academic programs, and that by doing these type of, this type of work, they're going to go beyond that. You know, you'll, you'll get all the scientific and, in, and educational benefits, but also the social benefits and you know, cross-cultural exchanges and, and hopefully bolstering U.S. industry. So uh, I think we can sell this to funders as all and more that they would get from other programs. Basically, what we have done is develop a prototype I'm gonna, I'm gonna where, which can be used not only for the purpose of getting funding from NSF, but by um, uh, other organizations as well that we can pitch this format to. For example, we were talking about the housing in Colombia. Uh, you know, the, the association there or the government agency there can be pitched the same format and, and funding can be obtained to, for the greater good of the community. One, one final comment in, in, from me at this point is that um, as much as we, we're trying, I think a lot of us identified the problems on the ground, um, which is one part of the, the issue, but identifying how to obtain uh, funding to help the problems on the ground is the pragmatic approach that we try to take. And maybe another approach might be to look at um, corporate foundations. You know, I'll just, I don't even know if Verizon has a foundation, but but I could imagine would they underwrite um, in research into uh, research in in the rural areas in the developing world where we've already heard it's not going to be PC based; it's going to be smartphone, right? So the whole cost of the PC is no longer even in the equation, perhaps, and and it's. What are the low-cost technologies? So I think we need, and again, thank you to NSF for, for this workshop, but I think we need to get creative on funding, funding streams. I, can I say something? Liz, uh, I think you, you have a great point there. In, in a lot of the big, uh, big industrial companies have social focus programs to help the communities in which they work. And, and one that I've interacted a little bit is the seed program run through Sch Schlumberger. You know, so they, they drill oil all over the world, right? And, and so that might be a way, you know, say Schlumberger is sponsoring my regular research anyway, that might be a way to, to get Schlumberger money to, to focus research, you know, on what we're talking about. It, it's not the sole answer, though. I mean, I appreciate the business model and everything, but it's going to be, and I'm thinking about this because of my own personal situation, and so maybe it's too personal, but if you don't have tenure, one of the ways you can get tenure is by getting federal grants that are peer-reviewed. Simply approaching a company and saying, look, I've got all this money and I made all this stuff in a community. Well, if there's no academic or institutional legitimacy to that, and it'll vary college to college, then that's got limited efficacy depending on what all of the outcomes need to be. I, so, I'd just like to play back something I've heard and pose a question f and so that I want to capture some of your thoughts, right? Some of what I've heard is that all the content that was generated here, even though NSF funded the workshop, thank you NSF, can literally be pitched to other organizations. So that's one takeaway in my mind, right? But there's another takeaway that came out of this, and that is if you really want to pitch it to NSF, which you should, it has to be crisp, it has to be focused, be aware of what other programs are, uh, what other programs than NSF are. So in my mind, I start to think through this content that was developed. There is a primary product that we're going to deliver, that's to NSF, based on this workshop. And there are all the derivative products that come out of this that will be pitched to other organizations. So my question to this team here is of experts who have worked with different corporations, with different funding agencies, with different funders. Could you shed some light 
on who are those possible funders, what would they be looking for, and how can we leverage some of this content? Just brainstorm of ideas. I have a, I have a half a million dollar grant right now from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to work on a housing project, but it's it's really a jobs program. It's you know, and that that's what it is. It's to build to create jobs on a, the Crow Reservation, and we'll begin working with four other tribes. So it's a different federal agency, but it's a, it's a project that for them was in the field. It wasn't a research project. It was a, we need to help, we need help figuring out how to build houses and how to make materials that they can afford to build houses out of. I was sort of looking at uh, it through the lens uh, of the uh, framework that came out uh, in, in our in our team, and in that framework, it, it seemed uh, almost any global corporation that wants to do experiments in in uh, future living ecosystems, um, right from construction to to uh, internet uh, companies to network-based companies and um, and anything to do with living uh, is 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 going to be interested in simulating out what the what the future would look like. And, and uh, therefore, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it becomes very compelling uh, from, from a business uh, value proposition also, uh, as a lot of corporations are finding out. So every corporation that has gone to India, for instance, right from Coke to GM to Ford, the question is to ask is, where did they all go there? Now Walmart wants to go to India and so on. So all of them would definitely be interested in finding out uh, and simulating out the future, uh, um, you know, five, five years down the road. Uh, so I, I see this as a fairly large, uh, large opportunity, and, and therefore for U.S. businesses to operate, and therefore for NSF uh, and NIH and uh, um, all the water organizations and so on and so forth. So and I think if you, if you sort of just break this down into pieces, you, you'll find very soon all the corn companies and everyone else uh, are out, out uh, here, you know, and all the food companies and packaging companies, they pretty much, I think this pretty much is, is quite wide open. Uh, it's, it's a fairly large game. So, so Karthik, can I piggyback on that question a little bit? I think there is the collective expertise and collective knowledge of who those people are. Um, if we can collect that, that piece of information, who those are, then maybe one option is, hey, we have all this content, how do you tailor it to those is that is that a fair? Yeah, I mean, yeah, right, right here in Indiana, for instance, Cummins is doing some experiments with rice husk, husk uh, local energy generation in India. I mean. You know, so, so they would definitely be interested, but you can extend this to everybody. But I think that's a good question to get from the group. So I just three things that I thought. One, in, in hearing people talk about NSF was, uh, to me, we kind of have a problem that's similar to the one that uh, design for the other 90% tried to address, and that is uh, maybe thinking of it as science for the other 90%. And I think that most of the science research is focused on that 10% that already has what they need. And we haven't shifted the direction towards the 90% that doesn't have it. Um, in terms of, of corporate funding, I think that, or at least I know that AT&T is very interested in funding at least the communication portion and at Brown there's a uh, global conversations program that they've funded fairly generously that IBM has an emerging markets focus and uh, they too I think are looking for ways to support research in that area. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we really have to think about uh, funding alternatives um, in very creative ways. And um, Matthew's point um, uh, is one that, uh, that, frankly, I hadn't immediately considered um, in terms of, of the, the educational, how, how, how the colleges and, 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 and researchers fit into, into, into what our structure was. I think they, they do fit. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that um, there are, for example, um, there are a couple of uh, organizations that are fairly large that are both in the architectural space and the engineering space that uh, Noha and I have been talking about for poten potential um, funding uh, for engineering for change. Um, then there are other issues that include um, how to deal with organizations in this space. And, and I don't know if you, I don't want to put you on the spot, Noha, but I know you've had some experience in, in dealing with, um, with, you know, engineering for change and, and seeking funding support. 
uh, I don't know if you want to shed any light into this conversation, but um, it, it is not an easy uh, situation. Yeah, um, I think we're talking about a lot of different things right now, and so we're spanning the spectrum. And I think what we originally started out was to try to sort of see a slice in this overall spectrum in terms of research. Um, to specifically answer your question, one of the things that we are struggling with is uh, most organizations don't want to fund operational or infrastructure related projects. They rather fund projects that are in fact around implementation working with the local communities. And so when you're talking about information sharing, when you're talking about collaboration platforms, that's not something they typically um, see as a direct impact on a community and can't go back to their, whether it be their boards or whomever, and say, you know, by spending $2,000 here, I was able to make this kind of impact on 10 individuals. So, um, but, but I think that's an entirely different type of funding challenge than what we're talking about here. And so, well, the one thing I did want to say is that um, there's a lot of really good things that have come out of this workshop. And I um, uh, want to be clear about sort of managing expectations. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, we touched on a lot of points and a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities. It, not to say that we're not going to explore them, but I think in terms of defining what the next star steps are, we need to be focused and we need to really figure out sort of what this is and what it isn't in terms of next steps. So. I would certainly consider that this entire group will get involved in that discussion, but um, I, we're not waiting for NSF. They're not our only option, but we are talking about research in this space, and, and we need to define that a little bit better, and we need to have that as one of the outcomes of this workshop. And the other thesis is that this workshop is one data point. Right. So in developing this overall report in terms of recommendations, we're certainly going to be needing to do a lot of work about what other research areas have we not explored as part of this discussion, what other opportunities exist. So um, again, that's another engagement point for you guys to go back and, and look at this space a little bit more broadly beyond the work, your own work, and help us define what else is happening in this space. So, um, you know, I'm really encouraged by the discussions we've had over the last two days. I know we're all fairly <laughs> tapped out intellectually, and, um, but you'll be hearing from us very soon because we can't continue to do this. We can't develop this report without that continued dialogue. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the question. I think we're dealing with a very, very big problem, and it, of course, uh, requires a systems-type approach to tackle it. And coming back to this uh, report, I feel a similar approach might be in order. Uh, so one thing could be that uh, the report has some kind of a roadmap document, like there are some immediate uh, research benefits to be uh, attained by getting funded programs, but maybe uh, we could come up with a roadmap. And I really feel we need a, uh, you know, a big ask. Uh, I look at the nanotechnology initiative, this problem is far greater. And if you don't create, or this report, or this workshop, or group, whenever, doesn't create a road map, uh, I think we have failed in our uh, <coughs> uh, ask or our communication. So one is to have a road map. It could be a multi-agency problem. It's already come out. It's not just NSF, but NSF could take the lead in pulling other agencies in. We heard a lot of corporate support. Uh, look at companies in India and China today. They have a lot more money than our own corporations here. And uh, <coughs> India has a CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Program. It's already in place. I think we need to pool the resources. And again, a big ask coordination at the governmental level is uh, what could uh, help uh, <coughs> be very effective in making these uh, resources available. So I know it's thinking way ahead, but a roadmap document at the end of the report, I think, would be excellent. So uh, can I ask a follow-up question to what you just asked? You said the ask should be big. And oh, OK. I just wanted to. Okay, it's such the uh, ask, yeah, which results in a big ask. Right. You look at the nanotechnology initiative, NSF initiated it. There were several intellectual folks like here sitting around, but then the uh, NSF directorate uh, went on and said that this is a problem of national importance. 
this is a problem of international importance and it is to our own strategic interest in this country that we tackle it. We don't need to work hard to communicate that, but then uh, follow up with an ask. Uh, as, as a follow up, um, yeah, we, we, are, we arrived at the same point. Uh, every time we looked at an issue or whatever in terms of a specific uh, problem, we began to see it in the bigger matrix of a general issue. And one of the things that we kept dealing with in our t uh, topic was thinking about problems from a village standpoint or a rural standpoint versus urban. So we finally had like a, just a, a, a discussion. The reality is, is like 150,000 people a week are moving from rural or village uh, environments into urban centers in developing countries. It's the biggest problem out there and it's gonna get bigger and bigger based on world population. So that's why uh, I prefaced my work about moving from single family houses about four or five years ago to at least uh, four to five story buildings because we have to deal with density in terms of urban context. So in, in my thinking about housing and stuff, which encompasses, I think, most of the other issues. I always think I'm thinking in an urban context. And this is well documented in the, in the planning communities. If you don't know of ISACARP, it's the International Society of City and Regional Planners. They're about a 50, 60-year-old organization that's been tracking uh, global demographics for decades. They're a wonderful organization. That's who I went to see when I was in Kenya in October. This is well documented in terms of the problem. And their statement says something like this. Whether we like it or not, people are moving to city centers for either uh, 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 war reasons, but more importantly, most people are moving there because they think there's a better life for them. The problem is they don't have resources and they don't have any tactics to deal with living in an urban context. Hence, you have slums. And this is the huge, like two, two and a half billion people out there that are dealing with this. So the point being, is that you cannot simplify this to a traditional village context or a single family housing system in, in my thinking. And in, and in, in fact, uh, I was just talking with Dr. Ken Yang from London this week, who's the world's greatest green sustainable architect. And he was talking with me about you know, our work. And he absolutely feels that in terms of sustainability and dealing with global housing and global cities, we have to deal with actually high rise uh, multi-family kind of housing units, which is really interesting back to the old modern attitude, but done properly. Uh, I'm not even taking that gamble yet, but the point being we have to deal with much more complex urban living problems, and they're much harder to deal with. So we finally admitted defeat. We went on for like two days, and we finally said, well, what we're saying is, is all these issues of water and energy and agriculture and communications, housing, they're all interrelated. And we simply said something like this, the old adage, uh, the, the sum of, whole, of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. In other words, classically, we all know this in our fields or in the funding agencies. They all want a simple grant that's very focused. I heard the word 10 times already. That's the problem. And so I agree with you guys that you need to go back to NSF. You have to have something that's focused. There's tons of specific uh, research things out there right now in certain fields that are very fundable within the matrix of what NSF probably will expect. But that's not the real issue. Every, that's already going on. Why are we here if we keep going back and checking the same boxes? The real issue is, and I'm completely agreeing with the last uh, statements, go back with a micro plan that's tangible, that's normal, so to speak, but the real issue coming out of this is the bigger comprehensive attitude about multidisciplinary research and funding because of the urban needs, and that's not normal. The question is, and that goes back to your bigger framework, I think you have to have a short-term focus thing you can go back with, but coming out of this, it's the bigger comprehensive framework that's so critical, and that's harder. But we, we felt like that in that big framework, it was about, uh, you know, governmental uh, funding agencies here. You mentioned NIH and others. All these things are interwoven in terms of these, we call it community research and planning. So they're all synergistically interrelated. And if you fund multiple things in one package, you get a great higher, much higher return. And of course, knowledge return too in terms of research. But we felt like traditional funding agencies, governmental authorities, and again, international, 
as well as institutions and private corporations. So it's a complex idea. It's a, a big, who used the big hag thing? Yeah, it's a big one. And we're not going to solve it today. But I think the key thing is to address it and then work at it. And uh, we have one more, uh, maybe one more comment. Final, you know, just, uh, I think we are basically trying to create a platform which will act as a platform for research as well as discovery of new problems, as uh, Anil put it, uh, and new research problems coming out of it. Great. Uh, with those excellent observations, uh, oh, one more. I apologize. Um, if, last one. if we want a big goal and a big ask, there's a prototype we can use called um, the Clean Cook Stoves Initiative which I don't know if you're familiar with it, but if you go to, I know the team is, cleancookstoves.org. It's $100 million, and it's controlled by the, the UN, but the U.S. is putting a lot of money into it. And if Clean Cook Stoves is attracted that much money, extreme affordability is even a bigger issue. This, Clean Cook Stoves is one of the extreme affordability issues. So if we, and it's a group probably something like this that encouraged the Clinton initiative to go for the clean cook stoves, and we can do the same thing. Excellent. Well, uh, we have to wrap up at this point uh, because we are already behind the schedule. So uh, thank you very much, uh, really, for an extraordinary two days of intense, stimulating, and revealing discussions. And uh, John wants to have a final word on that. I want to thank you because we, I just met you on Wednesday and you have done, uh, you're a terrific guy and uh, you've done a wonderful job with us. So thank you. Great. Well, uh, we will uh, now back up and, uh, and catch the bus to Muncie Symphony, uh, where we're going to have actually dinner. And uh, after dinner, we have a wonderful show um, uh, we can enjoy and wind down and relax. Ready? So let's take the discussions to dinner and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>